Hello, and welcome to Introduction to Cognitive Science. I'm here tonight to give you a quick introduction to the article, The Psychology of American Racism by Roberts and Rizzo. This article was published just this year in American Psychologist, and it's your second reading for the week. Um, sorry, I'm a bit late getting this to you. I actually think though that this article is pretty easy and that you won't have a very tough time with it. Um, it's written in a very conversational style, and I think it presents some of the research around um, around racism in both psychology, cognitive psychology, and um, social psychology pretty clearly. So I want us to, you know, in these last few weeks, we're thinking about applying uh, cognitive science to specific topics that affect us in society. And this particular topic is, is one that you might think about. Your writing prompt for your final paper, of course, is going to ask you to do this in more detail. And in the group work this week, I'm going to ask you to apply these methods to this topic. Oh, one other thing, I don't have a PowerPoint uh, going today. I uh, This is a new reading for this, this term. Indeed, it was not published until this year. Uh, so um, I'm not, uh, I didn't yet make a PowerPoint for this. And I think it's going to be pretty easy to talk through some of the main ideas. Okay, so here we go as uh, an introduction to this paper. So this paper is uh, focused on obviously racism in the American context. And you might ask, well, why focus on America? They take on this uh, question at the beginning. Of course, racism is prevalent everywhere in the world, um, but the authors themselves are Americans. They understand this context. And a lot of the research that they're looking at has been done in the American context uh, since America uh, obviously is a leader in education and has uh, lots of great psychology programs. Okay, so we're talking about um, uh, American racism in this article, and the article begins with some observations of the kinds of things uh, that they're talking about. Just, and, and first, you know, in, this, in these first few pages, you'll see um, the things they're talking about here are um, just like general effects that have been uh, observed in the literature that they're reporting on. So for example, uh, in, an, in a study by Bonham et al. published in 2016, uh, people reported or seemed to exhibit attitudes that suggested that white homeowners uh, were cleaner and more responsible than homeowners of color. Um, and this increased those homeowners, or they judged this increased their home equity in purchases. Um, white criminals, uh, indeed, are perceived as less blameworthy than criminals of color which decreases their likelihood of being executed. Um, this is in studies by Baldus et al. and Scott et al. Um, and, and there are other examples they discuss as well, but all these examples, uh, and again, these are based on like demographic observations. So looking at like general trends in uh, public records, all of these uh, suggest that American racism is alive and well. But now we might ask, well, how do we define racism? What do we mean by racism? And the authors usefully here provide us with a definition of racism. What they mean is simply a system of advantage based on race that is erected and maintained by an interplay between psychological factors and socio-political factors. So basically what they're thinking of is a system that is, uh, that is created and maintained by the kinds of items that we've been discussing, the, studying this term, psychological factors and societal factors right? Uh, um, that is uh, uh, dispositional factors that are within us and situational factors that we construct around us through our society, okay? So once again, racism is just a system of advantage based on race that's created and maintained by an interplay between psychological factors and socio-political factors. And the point of this article now is to discuss some of these different factors, some of these different factors that contribute to, um, to uh, racism in the American culture. And specifically, there are seven factors that they want to discuss here. So those factors uh, they label as categories, factions, segregation, hierarchy, power, media, and passivity, okay? And I would say that two of these factors are really squarely psychological factors in the sense in which we've been talking about. So those would be the factors of categories and factions. And I'm going to talk about those uh, mainly in what follows. The other factors, the, the latter five that they cover, segregation, hierarchy, power, 
media and passivity. These are more socio-political factors as they would talk about them. So segregation is obviously the fact that we live in America in very segregated communities. Um, white people live around white people, people of color live around people of color. And of course those are those uh, peoples are divided up into to different ethnic groups as well or segregated into different ethnic groups. So our socio-political um, milieu is such that we're separated in this way. Um, there are also, uh, they suggest there's a racial hierarchy in this country and that power is distributed along that hierarchy. And then of course we know that there are well-known findings related to media and passivity. Um, so um, of course, uh, there are representation effects in media such that people of color are represented less often in the programming that we observe. Uh, in fact, black Americans are, are, are represented fairly often, but other uh, races of color are not. And of course, this has uh, different kinds of effects on the way in which people envision their own life. Um, and then additionally, there's a kind of passive attitude that people have towards racism. And I'm actually gonna ask you in your group work to reflect on this passive attitude, to think about this passive attitude and to think about the ways in which this might be due to cognitive dissonance. But again, those five factors are the social factors. I'm not gonna talk about them a lot. They are, again, segregation, hierarchy, power, media, and passivity. And you'll see them at the end of the article. I think they're very interesting to think about, especially in relation to the papers that you're going to be writing. But I wanna spend just a minute talking about categories and factions, okay? And, and these, as I described, are more of the kind of psychological factors that are discussed in this article. So, Categories, I think we've talked about a lot in here. We've talked about categories as kinds of psychological concepts, right? And, and we've talked about different kinds of views of concepts. So we've talked about concepts that have like rigid boundaries, like our numerical con number, our numerical concepts. And then we've talked about concepts that don't have rigid boundaries, kinds of prototype concepts. And here we have in mind, or, or when we've talked about this, we've talked about things like the Paraha number system where the numbers function in this way such that they don't have these exact values. What is the closest approximation to R1 can sometimes be uh, used to apply to non-1 items. And what's the closest approximation to R2 can similarly be used to apply to non-2 items. Um, so we've talked a little bit about concepts and how those relate to categories. And in this article, they're really talking about how concepts and categories relate to racism. And some of the most interesting findings that I think they have here relate to the, the very idea that merely affixing labels to things leads us to generalize, right? So in one study they discuss, um, they discuss how these kind of category labels, labels that are applied to people can promote the belief that category uh, members share a kind of essence, like that they all have the same property that grants them a special identity. They discuss a series of studies here. One of the most interesting is, I think, um, involving four-year-old children in Chicago. And so um, they uh, introduced these four-year-old children to white or black individuals who were characterized by novel properties, properties, right? So the example they use is likes to go glabbing. I'm not actually sure from this if this is like a made up concept or if it's a real thing. A glaive is actually kind of sword, but I think it's just a made up kind of idea, right? So likes to go glaving, right? Um, so some of these little characters in the story like to go glaving, these four-year-olds are being told the story. And then they measure um, whether, the, whether the four year olds infer that others of the same race share the property, right? And now what happens is, so, so they're um, being presented to these, this one white character who likes to go glaving or this one black character who likes to go shaming or whatever these made up ideas are. And, and now the, the, the experimenters wanna see, well, do they generalize to the other white characters, these other white cartoon characters, these, or do they generalize these other black colored cartoon characters um, that they also like to do this other thing? And so what they find is that when children receive labels, right? So when they're told of the, the little black character or the little white character that, that the children are observing, when they're told this way Sean likes to go glaving, um, then 
they are more likely to generalize and say, well, the other way Sean's, the other black characters, the other white characters like to go glaving as well. Whereas if they're just told this one likes to go um, glaving, then they don't make that generalization. So I find this very interesting because it suggests these kind of minimal labels, uh, merely affixing these kind of labels in this very innocent kind of way can actually lead us to generalize, right? I, I think it's interesting to think, why does that happen? And it may be that, you know, our minds are just really meant to be these kind of generalizing information processing machines. So any label we can connect on, maybe we're just more likely to generalize from that. But in any case, it's an interesting effect. Now, they go on to discuss how this leads to an even more surprising fact. And that is that introducing these category labels or these generics additionally seems to promote a kind of descriptive to prescriptive tendency, right? So if I'm told this way Sean likes to go glaving, and that leads me to judge that way Sean's in general like to go glaving, then if I find this particular way Sean who is not glaving, I'll think, well, that way Sean should be glaving, right? So what we're actually doing is moving from a kind of descriptive fact about how a category generates to a prescriptive should, they should do this thing, right? And, and it's found again, um, that children do this very easily. And it's very surprising and somewhat disturbing. And it also turns out that children's tendency to make this move, to move from the merely descriptive to the prescriptive, um, uh, actually their, their, um, their negative attitude towards non-conforming, the study named the characters Hibbles and Glurks, uh, actually predicts their future negativity towards non-conforming black people and white people. So we can actually pick up at this very early age that these people who are categorizing in this way and making this prescriptive move have this kind of trait that will be advanced later in life, perhaps. Perhaps, right? This is one study, and I think it bears looking into more deeply. This is a very interesting finding. So again, that's the section on American categories. And I invite you, I mean, obviously, you need to look at that, read it, have a look. The other section uh, that is dealing with a more psychological factor is the section on American factions. I'm not gonna say a lot about this, but I think um, one interesting phenomena that's brought up here is the idea of a minimal group phenomena, okay? So, so what does this minimal group phenomena suggest? Well, in these studies, they have like divided people up in this very arbitrary way based upon like whether they overestimate a number or underestimate a number. And just based upon those thin categories, separating people into those groups, you find that you already get a kind of preference for your in-group members. Like just these people who happen to share this dumb um, property with you that they overestimate some average, right? You still share this in-group uh, feeling with them and want to promote their well-being over others, right? And so if this is true of these very minimal categories, these very minimal uh, uh, groups, minimal groups that we might belong to, then we can imagine a society where people are not arbitrarily assigned to these meaningless groups, but are instead systematically assigned to culturally important groups, how that would promote anti-egalitarian feelings amongst us. Okay, so this article discusses a lot of cool work. I think you'll have fun reading it. We'll talk about it when we meet together for our classwork on uh, you know, one of the later days of this week. And you'll talk about it too in your group work. So have a good evening and I will see you later this week.